A disadvantaged gang member joins the powerful crime syndicate of the New York Mafia, going against the Mafia code and his ambition for more. Over time, he rises through the ranks, ultimately killing the leader who had been in power for nearly a decade. This leader had succeeded the well-known and silent Carlo Gambino. Carlo Gambino, known for his low profile and prudence, was succeeded by the new head of the Gambino criminal family, John Gotti. Gotti, with his expressive and well-groomed persona, claimed to be just a plumbing supplies salesman. However, prosecutors alleged that he was a ruthless crime boss who used intimidation and murder to maintain power. The story of John Gotti's rise to mafia power became legendary during his lifetime. Despite being dubbed the Teflon Don, he faced scrutiny from the government, raising the question of why it took so long for them to bring him down. The narrative of John Gotti begins in 1940s New York, where the Italian Mafia, also known as La Cosa Nostra, had reigned supreme for over two decades. Growing up in the insecure circumstances of the Bronx's lower neighborhoods, Gotti faced financial struggles and bullying as a child. Dissatisfied with his father's efforts to support the family, he admired the respected figures in the neighborhood who seemed to display wealth and power. Emulating these figures, Gotti became bold, hot-tempered, and charismatic. After leaving high school, he joined a gang called the Fulton Rockaway Boys, engaging in minor crimes and gaining attention from the local mafia. Hired for specific jobs, he learned the skills of lying, cheating, and stealing for the mafia. Accumulating an impressive criminal record, Gotti's involvement with the Gambino family increased. Simultaneously, he formed a family with Victoria de Gorgio, whom he married in 1962. Despite attempting legitimate jobs, Gotti struggled to leave his criminal life behind, facing brief periods of imprisonment for robbery. Ultimately, after rising through the ranks and eliminating the existing leader, Gotti became the head of the Gambino crime family, earning a notorious reputation in the process. The Teflon Don moniker reflected the challenge authorities faced in bringing him to justice. Gotti realizes that his only future lies in working for the Gambino family and becomes a full-time criminal. The allure of drama, camaraderie with friends, and fast money proves irresistible to him. Consequently, he starts working full-time as a soldier within criminal families. With more money coming in, Gotti moves his family to Howard Beach, a middle-class neighborhood in Queens, New York, predominantly Italian. Despite living in a modest house, the neighborhood's strategic importance being close to JFK Airport makes it convenient for mafia activities. In 1968, the FBI arrests Gotti while attempting to steal a shipment of women's dresses. Despite legal troubles, his standing with mafia superiors improves. Gotti's brief prison stints allow him to associate with high-ranking mafia members. By 1972, Gotti knows Neil Della Croce, the second-in-command of the Gambino family, considering him a mentor. Della Croce takes Gotti under his wing, authorizing his involvement in a crew to enhance his efficiency for the Gambino family. Although not formally initiated into the Mafia, Gotti proves his worth by carrying out a revenge killing in 1973. His arrest in the following year is downplayed by hiring a renowned lawyer, changing murder charges to attempted homicide. Gotti serves only two years in prison. In 1976, while Gotti is in prison, Carlo Gambino dies of a heart attack. Paul Castellano, Gambino's cousin, becomes his successor. Upon Gotti's release, he is recognized for his loyalty, and the Gambino family is ready to accept him as a full-fledged member. Acknowledging Gotti's trustworthiness, ability to follow orders, and commitment to criminal activities, the family appoints him as a captain or capo of an operational unit within the Gambino crime family. Gotti officially becomes a leader of a gang and a significant organized crime family. In a city like New York, the power, wealth, and touch of fame are enticing. Gotti, along with his Queens crew, led by Neil Della Croce, represents the working-class faction of the Gambino crime family. In contrast, Paul Castellano and the Brooklyn men are more white-collar, involved in labor extortion. Castellano directs the Gambino criminal empire from his stronghold in Staten Island. In 1978, Gotti participates in the infamous Lufthansa heist, famously portrayed in the movie Goodfellas. Allegedly, in 1979, Gotti is the gunman who kills Tom DeSimone, a mafioso, according to informant Henry Hill. In a tragic incident in 1980, Gotti's 12-year-old son Frank is killed in a motorbike accident. John Favara, a neighbor, 
accidentally hits Frank with his car. Despite claims of it being an accident, tensions rise. Favara receives threats but believes he is safe until disappearing in July 1980. Gotti has a seemingly perfect alibi, being in Florida with his wife at the time. No one is prosecuted for Favara's disappearance. Meanwhile, Victoria Gotti, devastated by her son's death, falls into deep depression and attempts suicide. Gotti's family troubles extend beyond his home. The Gambino crime family experiences divisions after the death of boss Carlo Gambino. Neil Della Croce, initially bypassed for Paul Castellano, faces discontent. Gotti, loyal to Della Croce, openly criticizes Castellano for his reclusive and greedy nature. Gotti accuses Castellano of demanding large sums from Capos, questioning the legitimacy of his gains. Castellano, focused on legitimizing criminal earnings, avoids involvement in drug business to steer clear of legal trouble. Gotti, however, openly disapproves of Castellano's leadership style. Gotti becomes increasingly concerned in 1983 when his brother and friend, Angelo Ruggiero, face heroin trafficking charges. Ruggiero's connections with Gotti date back to their teenage years in Brooklyn, Allegedly, Gotti indirectly was also involved in the drug trade with his brother. Ruggiero's inability to stay silent becomes problematic, and Castellano, the family boss, hears rumors of FBI recordings incriminating Ruggiero. Castellano threatens to order Ruggiero's death for violating the Mafia's code. The pressure intensifies in 1984 and 1985. Castellano faces federal charges and a grand jury accuses the heads of the five New York Mafia families under a new law. Meanwhile, Neil Della Croce, the Gambino family underboss and Gotti's mentor, dies of cancer in December 1985. With Della Croce's death, Gotti fears Castellano might use him as an example for breaking family rules. Castellano, after Della Croce's death, appoints his driver and bodyguard, Thomas Bellotti, as his right-hand man, causing discontent among some family members. Castellano's absence at Della Croce's wake further fuels tension. Castellano worsens the situation by ordering the dispersal of Gotti's crew, assigning members to different groups. Gotti interprets this as a sign that some of his men might be targeted. Realizing he no longer has a protector in the family, Gotti believes he needs to act before Castellano orders a hit on him and his associates. In Gotti's mind, it's a kill-or-be-killed situation. Gotti doesn't plan to carry out the hit alone, understanding that assassinating a family boss is not a one-man job, no matter how brave one may be. Salvatore Sammy Gravano, loyal to Castellano, is one of the first men Gotti approaches for help, believing Gravano might be more loyal to him. Gravano, seeing a more promising future with Gotti, agrees to assist in eliminating Castellano. The conspiracy to kill Castellano involves other willing gangsters. The execution is well planned. One of Castellano's men informs Gotti that Castellano plans to dine at a luxurious Manhattan restaurant. Four men dressed similarly wait outside to confuse investigators or security systems. Gotti and Gravano, parked at the corner, observe the scene, waiting for Castellano to arrive and park in front of the restaurant. The hit team takes positions, and when Castellano arrives, the four shooters open fire, instantly killing Castellano, his bodyguards, and new right-hand man Thomas Bilotti. In the chaotic aftermath of Castellano's daring assassination, terrified pedestrians run for cover, passing by the bloodied bodies. After the attack, Gravano drives back to his office. After the daring street murders, everyone returned home, leaving the city of New York shocked by the audacity of the killings in broad daylight. A few days before the end of 1985, Gotti is formally elected the head of the Gambino criminal family, marking the beginning of a new era in Mafia history, the era of the stylish and handsome John Gotti. Overnight, Gotti becomes the leader and godfather of one of the largest and most significant criminal families in the United States. He transitions from a poor kid in the Bronx to the elegant king of New York. Inheriting a highly profitable empire with illegal operations generating around $500 million annually, Gotti controls a wide range of activities from seafood and meat distribution to trucking in Manhattan's fashion district and private garbage collection. During Gotti's reign, the FBI estimates numerous murders carried out on his orders, with three of the victims being members of the Gambino family. His personal gain is estimated between $5 and $12 million per year. With this extravagant wealth, Gotti transforms his wardrobe, leaving behind the days of worn-out clothes and mismatched shoes from his childhood. Ascending in the Mafia leads him to adopt an ostentatious lifestyle, 
wearing expensive Italian suits and always maintaining a well-groomed appearance. This earns him the nickname Dapper Don due to his elegance, including custom silk suits, camel wool coats, and hand-painted ties. Gotti, aware of his good looks, takes pride in his appearance. Gotti's wealth also enables him to indulge in his gambling addiction. Described as a compulsive gambler, he gets angry over losses, even betting large sums on events like football games, displaying a compulsive attitude. As the new boss, Gotti makes radical changes that will ultimately contribute to his downfall. He appoints Frank DeSico as the new underboss of the family, and Sammy Gravano is elevated to the rank of capo. Gotti demands his capos to meet weekly at the designated club on Mulberry Street and report to him. In January 1986, Gotti faces his first trial in Brooklyn, responding sharply to reporters' questions about being the family boss and killing Paul Castellano, Gotti proudly embraces the title of Dapper Don, emphasizing his elegance and apparent comfort in front of news cameras. Initially perceived as a joke, some thought Gotti dressed based on the Godfather movies rather than the reality of how mafiosos really dressed. Gotti's confidence grows with each victory, and his first legal triumph as the head of the Gambino family comes in March 1986. Accused of assaulting a man during a 1984 dispute, when the man testifies, he claims not to remember who hit him. Fearful, the victim decides not to testify against Gotti, elevating his label to the Teflon Don. With his newfound status, Gotti doesn't have much time to enjoy his first victory, as a few months later, a disaster occurs. A powerful bomb placed in his car kills Frank DeSico, his underboss. Gotti claims ignorance about who did it and why, but the real surprise is that DeSico wasn't the real target. The intended victim was Gotti himself. Vincent Gigante, the boss of the Genovese criminal family, holds a personal grudge against Gooty for eliminating Castellano without permission from other family bosses. After these events, what concerned John Gooty wasn't other criminal families, but the federal government, which sought to build a case against him in every possible way. Gotti would again face the courts. The prosecution heavily relies on the testimony of criminals who made deals to reduce their sentences. Gotti's defense attorney, known for his flamboyant behavior in court, seizes the opportunity to undermine the credibility of government witnesses. On March 13, 1987, the jury acquits Gotti of all charges, surprising many. Rumors circulate that at least one juror may have received money to vote in Gotti's favor. Years later, Sammy Gravano testifies that he himself funneled $60,000 to one of the jurors. Despite facing multiple trials, Gotti is acquitted on two more occasions earning him the title of the Teflon Don. Some attribute this, in part, to bribed jurors. However, Gotti continues to defy authorities, presenting himself as a simple plumbing businessman, openly challenging law enforcement. He offers coffee to agents and journalists, poses for photos, and maintains a defiant attitude. His challenging demeanor and behavior towards the press translate into a lack of solid evidence to convict him. John Gotti ascends to the position of head of the Gambino criminal family, becoming an influential figure capable of solving problems with a snap of his fingers. Under Gotti's leadership, FBI surveillance intensifies, suspecting his involvement in the murders of Paul Castellano and Thomas Bellotti, though they lack concrete evidence. After the setbacks of the initial federal trials, investigators aim to build a solid case. Their goals include developing informants close to Gotti, and using the information provided to place hidden microphones where Gotti might discuss criminal activities. In the summer of 1989, the FBI finally obtained secret court orders allowing agents to place hidden microphones in the social club, the apparent meeting place of Gotti and his associates. However, an informant reveals that Gotti and his lieutenants regularly meet in an apartment two floors above the club, accessed through internal stairs connecting both places. Placing a device in the apartment is a bold and successful move for the authorities, providing them with the necessary evidence to pursue John Gotti. The material consists of Gotti's own words recorded during five meetings in the apartment, with the most productive being on December 12, 1989. During that meeting, agents hear Gotti criticize Sammy Gravano, who is not present to defend himself and express concerns about the FBI's increased surveillance. The evidence collected during these recordings sets the stage for the government's case against John Gotti. John Gotti, also known as the Teflon Don and the Dapper Don, was a notorious American mobster and boss of the Gambino crime family. 
Born on October 27, 1940, in the South Bronx, Gotti rose through the ranks of the Mafia to become one of the most powerful and high-profile crime bosses in the United States. Gotti's criminal career began in the late 1950s, and he quickly gained a reputation for his involvement in various illegal activities. In 1985, he orchestrated the assassination of Paul Castellano, the Gambino family's boss, to assume control. This move solidified Gotti's position and earned him widespread notoriety. Despite being involved in numerous criminal enterprises, Gotti managed to avoid conviction in multiple trials during the 1980s. His ability to evade legal consequences led to the nickname the Teflon Don. However, law enforcement authorities, particularly the FBI, continued their efforts to bring him to justice. In 1990, Gotti's right-hand man, Salvatore Sammy the Bull Gravano, turned informant and provided crucial evidence against him. Secret recordings captured Gotti discussing direct involvement in murders, offering the FBI the necessary proof to bring charges. In December 1990, Gotti and Gravano were arrested on charges including murder conspiracy, bribery, extortion, illegal gambling, usury, obstruction of justice, and tax fraud. During the trial, the FBI played recorded conversations where Gotti spoke openly about ordering hits. These recordings, coupled with Gravano's testimony, sealed Gotti's fate. In 1992, Gotti was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Gotti's arrest and conviction drew criticism, with some viewing him as unfairly persecuted. In certain Italian-American neighborhoods, he was seen as a figure unjustly targeted by the government. Despite legal troubles, Gotti maintained an image of benevolence donating to churches and hospitals, further contributing to the public's misconception. In prison, Gotti's health deteriorated, and he underwent surgery for throat cancer in 1998. On June 10, 2002, John Gotti passed away at the age of 61. His funeral procession was elaborate, reflecting the enduring fascination with his life and criminal legacy. Gotti's family, particularly his wife Victoria, continued to emphasize his positive qualities downplaying his criminal activities. John Gotti's story remains a significant part of American organized crime history, depicted in various media, including movies, television, and books.